a lake of, of, of sorts. Then behind us is one of the most uh, famous crater lakes. In full, it's called uh, Lake Chigere Kyanyinamuiru. Yes, but usually it's commonly known as um, Lake Chigere, as you can see. And uh, behind you guys, behind the, we have uh, the Kaliango Rolling Hills. Those hills there with, with the caldera on top. And then we have Kamutebi uh, Swamp. We have the Renzori Mountains right there. We have Fort Porto City on my left. We have mountains of the University. We have Katojo Prisons. We have Mohoti Barracks and so many attractions in this place. So when you're here, you get to experience one of the best views in Uganda. There is also Nyakasura School where those guys uh, wear kilts, those red iron sheets, and all that you get to enjoy it after hiking this Cheganyo Hill. It's a breathtaking hike, not for everyone. The name Cheganyo means, in our local language in Rotoro, it means something that people eat, try to avoid Cheganyo. Kweganyo is to avoid Kweganyo. To avoid. So that's why they named this uh, hill Cheganyo. Like you guys realized when you're trying to, at the start of the hike, everyone was like, ah, ah, we have to. I'm not going, I'm not going. It had to take so long for people to hike. So that's where the name uh, came from. This one, this lake is called uh, Chigere Kyanyinamuiru because on the other side of the, uh, of the lake, there is a rock with a foot of, uh, it's believed to be the footprint of uh, Nyinamuiru. So that's why the lake is called uh, Lake Chigere. Yeah, and uh, behind uh, the, the rolling hills is where we find the Maverga Nyinamuiru caves and so many other breathtaking attractions. So if you think that you've had it all, that you've explored Uganda, but you've not been to this spot, then I don't know what you've really done. Because every time you travel, you think that you've seen it all. But every time you go back, there's still something new for you. So I don't know how many times I go to a destination, because even experiences become different with the people that you go with. So I don't know you who has not been to this place. I don't know what you're really thinking. But for me, I'm here to uncover for you all the hidden games that are endowed in the Pearl of Africa. So thank you so much. This is the GM Tourism Express with Irene Alena Misango. Catch you tomorrow. Well, good morning and welcome back from uh, Eid El Fitri celebrations. It's time for business this morning. I'm Jerome Paul Sonko, and our very first report is uh, rotating around people with disability, persons with disabilities, because uh, in Ginger City, at least 60 persons with disabilities have received 56. 0.9 million Ugandan shillings, a grant from the government to improve uh, their livelihood. Now, the beneficiaries have also been equipped with <coughs> skills uh, to manage uh, their finances and also their startups, plus the innovations that they would uh, come up with after receiving this money in order to implement uh, various projects that will help them grow more finances and also secure their future. Now, the male councillor representing persons with disabilities in the city, um, in the city in the Ginger City Council, Juma Sozi, cautioned the beneficiaries against using the money uh, to organize weddings as it has been uh, for the past few years, where when government uh, sends out money, uh, others uh, either build houses, use it for travel, others also um, use it for entertainment purposes by drinking it all in uh, bars and restaurants and this time around uh, they've been cautioned not to use this money uh, to hold f their fancy weddings now besides that uh, he further explained that the money is intended to help persons with disability uh, to get out of poverty by injecting capital into their businesses or starting new enterprises now according to him persons with disabilities continue to struggle a lot uh, while uh, trying to earn a living when you look at uh, the way they are discriminated in most societies and then also uh, not so many of them have the chance to get uh, employed 
in the employment spaces in the country, especially in the corporate spaces, unless when one has um, you know, their own businesses. So this particular money, uh, that is um, to a tune of 56.9 million, uh, million, is one that is actually being pushed to ensure uh, that they can be able uh, to benefit from the same, start up something very small, but uh, be able to generate more income. At least 60 persons uh, with disability have been able uh, to receive this grant. But, most, but the most important bit of it has been you know, helping them uh, with uh, business ideas and also teaching them on how to manage businesses and these finances. Because sometimes when such money comes in as a grant, most people just use it anyhow, simply because it is just given to them. And it has no... Uh, you know, direction to whether they will start up something, all that. And this is something that uh, the Ginger City, the Ginger Council members have actually decided that before they get this money, they have to be trained and at least uh, given further, you know, ideas on how to start up businesses and how to run their finances that have been given to them. So a tune of 56.9 million uh, Ugandan shillings is what? Uh, at least 60 persons with disabilities in Jinja will receive. <coughs> and now we talk matters Bududa landslides because according to more details coming in from the same government has offered 10 million per family to relocate from uh, the landslide prone Bududa. And now as matters to address climate change and uh, being more proactive than reactive, the government has at least uh, given 1,000 households in Uganda's Ergon sub-region or is set to give uh, 10 million per household in uh, the Elgon sub region from the office of the Prime Minister to relocate from the landslide prone area and other risk mountainous areas with uh, these slopes that are exceeding 30 degrees above sea level. Now, the most vulnerable beneficiaries have been mapped out in the eastern districts of Bududa, uh, Manafwa, Namisindwa, and Sironko. And 10 billion Ugandan shillings project is set to kick off this week on Friday, where at least 1,000 families will be receiving 10 million each. Now, the 10 million will be helping them to relocate from those areas to go and seek for other areas that the government um, deems fit, simply because of uh, the ever-changing um, climate, and especially when you look at the Elegon sub-region, where landslides have been one of the, the key hindrances to the development of that area, or at times uh, leading to the death of many and destruction of property over the years. Now, away from that, uh, when you look at it from here, uh, the locals were urged uh, from uh, misusing the money. So it also goes back to the fact that we've given you 10 million to relocate. Do not misuse the money by drinking or setting up, let's say, a party or something. And uh, they've at least uh, been told uh, that this money uh, should help them to look for a new place where they can start a new life. Now, the government also denounced over 4,000 beneficiaries who previously received 7 million each uh, to relocate but abused the money because it had no conditions. And uh, of course, uh, giving uh, examples of those who had been given 7 million earlier and they misused the money and did not relocate. Now, in 2021, at least, uh, at least 3,620 uh, 3, families were displaced in eastern Uganda and uh, the majority in the sub. Elgon in the Elgon sub region. Now, so far, the government has only been able to relocate at least 250 uh, families uh, permanently to Bulambuli district uh, away from uh, the Elgon sub region. Now, that is something that you can uh, greatly look at and see that the government is uh, trying to prepare uh, itself of, or preparing the people for any sort of disaster so that we do not lose uh, huge scores of uh, Ugandans. Now, away from that, we now turn our focus uh, to a public notice coming in from uh, State House. Uh, earlier this week, uh, Monday and Tuesday, saw traders in Kampala going on a strike. Monday, a full day strike from uh, traders in downtown Kampala under uh, their umbrella body, Kampala City Traders Association. And on Tuesday, uh, those in Masaka also joined the same cause. Why were they striking? Uh, matters to do with taxation, rent areas, but most importantly, uh, the issue of uh, 
IFRS, something that many of the traders feel is uh, quite an additional tax, as URA is still in a tussle uh, to make sure that they uh, teach the traders how to use uh, the system. Now, this uh, statement, uh, public notice, as of Wednesday, April 10th, 2024, the Presidential Press Unit has noted with concern the information circulating on social media regarding His Excellency the President's scheduled address uh, to Kampala traders on Friday, April 12, 2024, at Kololo Ceremonial Grounds. And the PPU uh, wishes to clarify that this information is untrue. In a meeting with Kampala traders um, in, is indeed planned, according to the uh, presidential press unit, uh, all relevant stakeholders will be duly informed on, um, on when they will meet the president of the country. And now lastly, from our uh, business this morning, we now look at the Forex market, how various currencies were faring on the Forex exchange yesterday on ED Day. Uh, this is courtesy of the Bank of Uganda. The US dollar was buying at 3,805.42 shillings while selling at 3,815.42 shillings. That was opening time. Now, closing time, so the US dollar buy at 3,790.00 while selling at 3,800.00 shillings. It was the same uh, price as Tuesday, by the way. Now, <coughs> the Great Britain pound was buying at 4,798.14 shillings while selling at 4,810.80 shillings. And the euro was buying at 4,115.94, while selling at 4,126.80. Then the Kenyan shilling was buying at 29.15, while selling at 29.23. The Tanzanian shilling was buying at 1.46, while selling at 1.47. As the South African rand was buying at 203.51, while selling at 204.04. So that's how you will find the Forex market for those uh, moving out to exchange some currencies and for those in forex uh, trade. Good morning and uh, coming up now is the traffic update with Chantal Oliver Kandinda. Stick around. Good morning and welcome back from Eid celebrations. I hope you had lovely ones and if you got time off to rest, especially for you, the non-Muslims, that is good for you. As of yesterday, uh, there was no traffic literally on the roads. For us that had a chance to be on the roads, especially in the morning around this time, we were, we were having a good time. It, it, the Kampala roads are really better without very many people on there. But as you can see, we have some traffic already as we are trying to make our way to town. If you are someone that is a dweller of uh, Chiwatule, a dweller of Ntinda, uh, you also dwell uh, in the areas of, uh, in the areas of, uh, of Nigeria. As you can see, there is traffic already on your way as you're trying to make your way to town. If you're coming from Nalia side, uh, as you can see, uh, there is a bit of holdups. Now the Nalia roundabout seems okay. Uh, but from Nalia Road, there is uh, traffic uh, leading you uh, to, uh, if you want to join, uh, if you want to join in Tinder Road, you will realize that there is a lot of traffic, a lot of traffic on uh, Nalia Road coming to, coming to Tinder side. But uh, in the middle there, you will see that, you will see that there's a bit of holdups and some parts that really have, uh, that are mad with a lot of traffic. Uh, generally, you need to brace yourself for a lot of that. All the way, all the way. Uh, if you're coming, if you're coming from, um, if you if you're coming from, if you're coming from the side that has uh, the Tulima water pump, you you realize as you're getting closer to joining the road that has in Tinder Road, there is a lot of traffic. But after that, onto now Old Chira Road, there is traffic all the way up. Uh, th this is all it's Old Chira Road, but this is all in Tinder. 
And as you're moving, you will only after, I think it, this is after St. Francis, that's why you will not find traffic. It is not busy until you get to the junction that has corner view. That is why you'll find a little bit of traffic that could be because of the lights. But further, you'll, 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 find, easy, you'll find it easy for you to move and uh, down, easy for you to move as now you are joining as you're trying to join the Bukoton Tinder Road, you realize uh, the only part that has a bit of traffic is uh, the part that has the junction uh, that, that, is, that is closing into Middle East. That's where there is uh, a bit of traffic and slow movement. And uh, now if you are looking at a place that leads you to International Large Uganda, that's where, that's where there will be a little bit of traffic but nothing to worry about on that junction. Uh, 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 around UMC, that is Victoria Hospital, that is where there is slow movement of traffic, but now we are on to Chira Road, or call it Ntinda Bukoto Road, uh, still on Ntinda Bukoto Road. You are relatively okay to move, but now on Chira Road, after the first lights, that is the ones around St. Andrew's Church, you are okay to move, but... Uh, shortly after that, the next lights, there, are there is a part that is mud with some bit of traffic. If you're trying to, if you're trying to join the Kamocha Road or the one that is uh, the one that that is used as a shortcut in most cases, that is the one. It is also called Old Chira Road. But if you are staying onto Chira Road, the holdups are nothing to worry about. It's just slow movement of traffic and generally caused by either the, the, the lights or any junction. But now when you reach the Chira Road police station, that is where there is also some traffic lights, you realize that for people who are coming from town trying to get, uh, to get say, to Bukoto, you will find there is traffic, especially at the lights. But shortly after that, depending on where you want to go, you seem to be okay if you come into town, and you are using, you're still on Chira Road trying to use, uh, trying to use Kamocha side. You seem to be okay to move. There's just slow movement in the middle there, but generally you are safe to move. Even the junction that usually, usually has traffic. Now the junction that takes you to Tafno Drive is okay. Uh, the junction that uh, takes you to Akesha Avenue is just having some slow movement but generally you are okay to move. Now, if you are continuing and you're trying to connect to Mulago side, my friend, you better use that route, but the only part that you will be finding, we, finding challenges with is the junction that takes you to Mulago Nurses Hospital, but also at the roundabout that is known as the Tuko roundabout. That is where there is a lot of traffic. If you are coming uh, from the side of Binaisa Road, uh, if you're coming from the side of Mulago 1, if you're also coming from the side uh, that has Bombo Road, you will realize that when you reach the Tuko uh, roundabout, there is a lot of traffic on there. Vinaisa Road is mud with too much traffic. As you can see now, at, at the roundabout that has at the roundabout that has Gayaza Road, the roundabout that also is shortly uh, shortly uh, before the Synagogue Church of All Nations, there is a lot of traffic. If you have another route that you can use, I highly recommend you take that route. Bombo Road is mud with some traffic, but also it gets, it gets a bit tight and then loosens. But generally, there is traffic on Bombo Road. And also, if you are, if you are thinking of proceeding uh, with Bombo Road trying to get to one degree side, brace yourself for lots and lots of traffic. Slow movements in the middle there, but there is a lot of traffic that you might have to prepare yourself for. And then from the Tuko roundabout, if you're using the Tuko roundabout and you're trying to connect, you're trying to connect to Yusuf Lule Road, you are okay until you are closing into the UNDP offices in Uganda. That's where there's a little bit of traffic. But after that, you're still safe. You're still safe to move, as you can see, until you reach the fairway lights. Uh, but also, you are okay to move. Now, golf course side also has a, lot of, a little bit of traffic. If you are coming from the Acacia Avenue, that is where you'll be finding lots and lots of traffic. But also, for people who are coming from the fairway lights, going down up, trying to use Acacia Avenue uh, to connect to Kamocha side, to connect to, to Mawanda Road side, you realize there is some traffic in the middle there, but after, you seem to be safe 
to move. Generally, that is how traffic is standing. If you're proceeding onto Yusuf Ulule Road, you are okay to move Garden City side until you reach uh, the, 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 the roundabout that has Nile Avenue, the roundabout that has Centenary Lane. You will be finding a little bit of traffic, but after that, you are okay to move. If you are coming onto Nile Avenue, safe to move, I would say. Uh, Durinton Road, there is uh, just slow movement, but generally you are safe. However, if you get to the traffic lights at Ginger Road, of course, you will be finding a lot of traffic. If you're trying to connect to the roundabout that is onto, that is onto Ginger Road, what is also usually known as uh, the Airtel uh, Tower, the, the Airtel Tower Clock, you'll find a lot of traffic if you're trying to connect, uh, if you're coming from Ginger Road side, if you're coming from Lugogo Bypass side, uh, Lugogo, yes, Lugogo Bypass side, you'll be finding traffic. But also if you are trying to connect to Wampeo Avenue, I suggest you brace yourself for the traffic that is onto that road. If you're trying to join uh, the Mukwana roundabout, you are seemingly okay to move 6th Street. In the middle has a bit of traffic. However, 7th Street seems to be safe, except in the middle there. This, is, this could be caused by the road inside because we all do know how it stands. Mukwana Road is mud with traffic, both incoming and those who are going. So brace yourself for that. Well, that's it generally for how traffic is standing we try to make sure that uh, get bits and pieces of the different roads around town that usually have a lot of traffic so now you know how to move i wish you a good day my name is chantal olive akandinda live from upc studios in kampala this is Good Morning Uganda. Pick of the day on UBC. Was brought to you by MTN Momo Pay is the easy way to pay. Dial star 165 star 3 hash or use the MTN Momo app. You don't need cash. MTN Momo Pay is safe and free. Lachuli Zono Industrial is one of the presidential initiatives which is brought here in Lachuli land to skill our youth. The skilling is free of charge. What you really need, you have to be within the age of 18 to 35. They don't need any requirements apart from being willing. You have to be willing and a youth who is willing to get these skills. The courses we have started with only four. That is tailoring, hairdressing, carpentry and welding. First intake we registered. 212, we admitted, sorry, 212 students from 10 administrative units of Acholi. These students, they recruited them from different districts within the Acholi sub-region. If we continue with this cooperation, many administrative, many, many beneficiaries will pass through us and they will require, they will go with enough skills and on skills, which will change them and later bring them into money economy. We shall really fight poverty in that way. Nyati Motion Pictures brings you Tuko Pamoja, a documentary film about our unity as Ugandans and Africans. Bunyoro would have simply created an East African community that we are looking for today. The rulers of Bunyoro are actually Luos. We people who live across the Nile, we are so related from our myth all from just the knife. We were the same people and genetically we are even the same people. We are similar people. We are one. Pamoja, we are one. Use that word, Pamoja. Pamoja.
premiering every week from 3rd February to June 2024 at the National Theatre and Indira Centre. Daily screenings are from 4th February to June 2024 at Ham Cinemax and the National Theatre. To get a ticket, call 0778-787-660. Tuko pamoja? Juko. Yo. How are you? Check the shopping man. What's your secret? <laughs> mm. Haven't you heard of the Paris Tivo Men Modo PDM? Yes, I did, but I thought it was just a talk. Ah, no, sir. It is real. Mm. I and a few friends together mm -hmm. formed a circle, accessed money from the PDM, mm. invested in a portrait project, mm. and now things are moving. Uh, 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 Juko. <laughs> I thought I was one of your friends. You are. But you left me behind. I didn't leave you in poverty. Mm. Go on you do, uh -huh. just visit your LC2 chairperson and mm. your parish chief mm. Eh? Mm. and start the process of economic transformation. Mm. Eh, just like that. Okay. <laughs> the parish chief of men model is an initiative from the government of Uganda mm. through the Ministry of Local Government mm -hmm. designed to transform all lives of Ugandans for the better. <laughs> <laughs> PDM, my parish, my development, my life. UBC is the national public broadcaster. We educate, inform, entertain, and inspire our audiences. You can watch us on free-to-air channel 001, DSTV channel 282, Go TV channel 371, Star Times channel 201, Zuku TV channel 20, and Azam TV channel 350. Even when your subscription expires, you can still watch UBC for free on your pay TV platforms. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala, this is Good Morning Uganda. Just seven minutes past the top of the hour, which is eight. Thank you so much for being with us, and uh, welcome to Good Morning Uganda Agenda. I'm Robert Chirabo and we are here yet to discuss another issue of national concern, most when it comes to our brothers and sisters in the business community. And don't forget, it is the business community from which we get taxes that we are enable, that enable us to fund various programs of our national budget. Now, when you look at the previous, or this, the financial year ending, you'll see that you are at a target of about 29.7 trillion to collect. Now, let's rough that at about uh, 30 trillion to be collected by URA. And closure of Feb, maybe they were about 18 million. But that's not what we are going to be discussing this morning. However, it's still in the same line because we are going to be discussing issues of taxation and that is the IFRI system, the electronic physical receipting and invoicing system, a digital system implemented by URA to automate the generation and also issuance of receipts and invoice for business transactions in Uganda. Now, we saw traders put down their tools and saying, no, this system is unfair to us and we want URA to hold it or only ensure that the big people, the manufacturers are the ones to pay this. But I'm not alone on this. I have the acting manager, tax education, Uganda Revenue Authority, one of the areas that was also fronted so much, and that is Masembe. Michael, you're most welcome. Thank you for hosting me, Robert. I'm glad to be here once again. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm very fine. Oh, yes, indeed. How is URA? The URA is good. Uh, we are trying to continue with the job mm. that's been given to us to mobilize the 30 trillion from among the Ugandans. And we want to congratulate them for coming through on that task. Of course, there is still somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at our performance by end of March, we were at around 19.5 trillion. Mm -hmm. Now that gives us a, around a 65% performance uh, against uh, the annual target that was given mm -hmm. to us. Now we have just three months. This is April, May, June. 
to the end of the financial year. We hope and we still believe uh, that we can still match it with the support of the Ugandans. And that is the call that we are here to rally today, this morning. Mm. Yes. But the cash milk seems starved. Uh, yeah, you can talk about that. The cash cow seems yes, starved. Yes. yes, now you can talk about that, but uh, that notwithstanding, mm. you cannot wallow in the challenges that you are having. You, you just have to look at uh, the best way to go forward, uh, find solutions and work around to the challenges that people have. Uh, that's why you cannot have uh, a static tax policy or regime. The challenges that come, you have to design administrative and policy interventions to address them. And partly, these are the discussions that we are having. And uh, we are just very optimistic that at the end of the day, we'll find a solution to whatever is standing in our way. Now, I'm hosting you at a time when we are having uh, the IFRS issue tabling. Yes, yes. Parliament, business community. But let's begin by understanding this. One, we've defined, many people have heard of it, but the question now is, what did you already intend mm. to, to achieve by coming up with an IFLI system? Because sometimes, yes. mm. I've seen from uh, the Commissioner General John uh, Musinguzi and many people trying to make this look so straight mm. that you are thinking of the traders so much. Mm. and you brought up such a system. Yes. Now, you'll permit me, mm -hmm. because it becomes very hard to explain IFRIS when one doesn't know what it is actually supporting or where mm -hmm. its mandate sits. And basically, IFRIS is to support the monitoring and declaration by traders of value-added tax. Mm -hmm. Now, remember the same value-added tax. It came around Uganda, I think, ninety-six. 1996. Mm. IFRIS is primarily a tool, a monitoring tool, and a declaration tool for value-added tax. Now, value-added tax itself needs to be understood. Before we talk about mm. the system that's monitoring it, it's very important that we understand value-added tax. Now, value-added tax for starters, it's not only in Uganda. Uh, I don't know, we have around 195 countries in the world. I think 195, 93, 95. And of all these countries in the world, value-added tax is implemented in 175 countries. It's only a few, around 20 countries, including the USA, that have not adopted a value-added tax. And uh, for them, they have a sales tax, which we do not have. Uganda had sales tax before, and mm -hmm. it's normal, uh, and other countries. but. It is the value-added tax that we are talking about. When we are talking IFRIS, mm -hmm. we actually mean value-added tax. And the rate of the tax is in between, I've seen countries having it between 16% up to 27%. If you go to countries like Hungary, it's 27%. Go to Denmark, Sweden, it is 25%. That was 18 Uganda, Uganda is 18%. Yes. Okay. Uh, Kenya, I think 16, mm -hmm. around there. Uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, we are oh. Tanzania mainland, it is 18%. So majority of the countries on value added tax are at 18%, oh. many of the countries. Now, what is value added tax? First, the value that is added on anything in the context of Uganda should be 5% plus. So if anything, if I have this pen, and its value is, uh, I mean, added to by 5% if it was 1,000 shillings, or let's say if it's 100 shillings. And whatever you do about this pen appreciates its value to 105 shillings. Then it is candidate for value added tax. Okay. Now, this tax, the way it operates is on multiple stages. From the manufacturer to the major distributor, to the wholesaler, to the retailer, until the item reaches the final consumer. Now, those are the multi-stages at which value-added tax is uh, mm. expected to be collected. Uh, now, allow me to use that particular word. Mm. Getting collected. you all the way through. Yes, collected. Now, the payer 
or the person who actually meets this tax is you who uses this pen finally. Mm. The manufacturer is only asked to collect it from you who mm. buys. Uh, I hope you get me here, mm -hmm. sir. So the, the element is we've had scenarios of between either the manufacturer, uh, the major distributor, the wholesaler, and the retailer, this tax has been collected from buyers, but it has not been reported or declared to URA. Okay. It has not been remitted to the mm. Uganda Revenue Authority. And when you buy this pen, uh, let me assume you're a wholesaler, oh. and you buy this pen from the distributor, he will charge you value-added tax. When you sell this pen to your retailer or customer, you will charge that person value-added tax. Mm. Now, if this pen is 1,000 shillings, maybe it was supposed to be 700 shillings, and there is value-added, uh, you put a price, mm. of course, a markup, so it was 700 shillings, and maybe you add 100 shillings, which would have been your mm. profit. So it becomes 800 mm. shillings. Then the government asks you to add 18% which is VAT. Now, where you have bought this pen, the government is willing to give you that credit, to give it back to you as a reduction in the tax you have to pay. And to the customer to whom you sell this pen, you will be asked to give that VAT to government. So it is that it follows, therefore, that government gives you <coughs> back the credit of the VAT that where you bought this pen, because it was a cost in the price where you bought the pen. And then you give government the VAT that you take from the customer. So as a shopkeeper, you're a collector of value added tax. Now, where is the mechanism of us tracking how much you were charged where you bought the pen mm. and how much you've charged the customer to whom you've sold the what? The pen. Government is willing to give you the VAT back from where you, that was charged where you bought the pen. And government is asking you to give it the VAT that you have charged from the customer who has bought the pen from you. There has not been a mechanism of tracking that transaction. That is what the electronic fiscal receipting and invoicing solution gives us. So it takes me back to your question. What is the electronic fiscal receipting and invoicing solution? What is IFRIS? What is it doing? It is a revenue monitoring system that enables traders to issue electronic invoices or electronic receipts to customers when they are selling to them. And to also ask for electronic invoices and receipts maybe from where they have purchased. The purpose of the system, one, is to enable you keep track and accurately report transactions that you have made on which tax credit may be due to you or on which expenses may be uh, reported such that you can reduce on your tax liability and then for the URA that the accurate tax is paid. So it is a revenue receipting, it is a document, okay, mm -hmm keeping a document management system, it's a record management system, but the main purpose for the URA is to ensure that accurate taxes are declared and reported. And for you as a taxpayer, that any tax credit due to you is actually given to you. Now, Michael, if that is as good as you've said, hmm. first, let's understand who pays VAT, because when I was looking at the URA portal, hmm. we have about 600 Yes. People that are paying VAT. Oh, now, yeah. it's actually more than uh, that. Uh, around that, yes. not so. Yes. Uh, when we look at the portal, how many people are? The register, persons registered, registered for VAT. We have on the register over 31,000. About that number. Yes. yes. Now, what is very uh, confusing, you're giving that sweet explanation. Yes. We look at every trader. Yes. Down there. Mm up in arms against a system so good like you say mm -hmm. to them yes yet when i look at many of them i think a person who, who pays value added tax 
is a person who has about a turn up of uh, is it 150 a million in a year million in yes. a year yes now when i saw those traders demonstrating i'm sorry i'm not looking into people's businesses but this is a fact i could look at some of them mm. that they cannot have a turn up mm. of 150 million a year their yes. businesses yes and they were demonstrating against this striking against this mm. are you telling the truth yeah i i would like to reaffirm that these are the facts uh, as we put them because uh, i have been uh, oh. on certain occasions down the central business district i've been across the country uh, i've been in valley mm -hmm. i've been in masaka i've been in barara on the same i've been in arua on the same awareness for mm -hmm. ifris among other tax awareness activities uh, we have conducted a bit of this tax awareness on these now, the, the reality is, when you talk about this tax, value-added tax, it is not for everyone. And mm -hmm. I need to still uh, agree with you. Within the people that are right now uh, putting down their work tools, we have some who actually have no obligations for IFRIS and value-added tax. We have within them people whose turnover is below 150 million, at which the requirement the compulsory requirement for you to be on value added tax and there, therefore IFRIS uh, bites or comes in. And so there is a bit of some lack of uh, awareness or information dissemination to them mm -hmm. that for you IFRIS is not compulsory, okay, because mm -hmm. you're not within the mandatory bracket or we, you're not within the threshold and above where you need to be on value added tax. But where someone has made a turnover of 150 million plus mm. in a year, it automatically follows that you need to register for value added tax and therefore you need to be on the electronic fiscal receipting and invoicing solution tool. And now that also needs to bring us into a certain other level of context that you need to be dealing in taxable supplies. Mm. You could be downtown and your shop is strictly dealing in solar equipment. Solar. You deal in solar bulbs, solar batteries, everything specifically. Solar is exempt from, solar items are exempt from value added tax. So if risk shouldn't be a thing to bother you, you could be dealing in items of that kind. You could be dealing in uh, maybe agriculture uh, fertilizers and those pesticides and those uh, other inputs like hose. VAT does not apply to you because those items are VAT exempt. exempt. And therefore, IFRIS is not for you. Oh. Okay? But what the encouragement, just to pass this message across for such people, is keep proper, accurate records. Oh. When you're giving someone a receipt, a normal receipt, maybe written or what, oh. let it be complete, let it be accurate. The challenge and the reason we came up with IFRIS was, because IFRIS wasn't there oh. the, in Uganda, we are the last oh. East African country to implement this. Oh. Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda have already done this. Oh. We're just coming in last. But the reason we are actually considering, or the reason we came up with this starting 2020, was after we made a series of incomplete, inaccurate, and at times fictitious records being submitted to the Uganda Revenue Authority with claims for value-added tax. Oh. Remember, we talked about a scenario where URA is required to give you credit where you have paid your VAT, wherever you've expensed or purchased. Now, someone will come with receipts and invoices, I mean before, someone would come, and they would claim that, you see, I purchased these items, I spent on these items and there is value added tax. And we could give these people the credit. But then you could wait at the end of the month or two months that follow to see that the people from whom these purchases were made come to show you that I sold to Robert. Okay? We gave back where it was in a pool. Oh. But then you're waiting for someone to come and tell you I made a sale to Robert. And these people could not show up. So we had many scenarios of the kind where mm. government was giving tax credits and there was no commensurate or there was no uh, reporting of those transactions by the sellers. Mm. And so the challenge was 
we were finding ourselves in circumstances of giving more credit than the output that we are seeing. And that mm -hmm. is revenue leakage, and it needed to be plugged. Two, this, where someone was making a purchase, and uh, there is no record of any kind, you deny them the credit that they can knock off as an expense, maybe at the end of the year, mm -hmm. or as an input. So that is where you find traders telling you, I paid this tax at this level, and I'm paying it at this level, that is double taxation. You get it? That yet, is... Yet, yet there's lack of proper documentation. Yes. So the problem is not double taxation in this case. The problem is, if there is this tax being paid at the level of the manufacturer, and we are getting at the level of the wholesaler, and the same tax is appearing, yes, pay it. Because the one that you paid at the manufacturer level is due to you as a credit. Now, uh, yes. I know you are a, your tax collector. Yes. But I also know many of you could be running businesses. Mm. Now, there is an assumption <coughs> by you, RA, that as I'm giving out these receipts, these invoices, I'm actually being paid. But you know very well that in mm. business, you know, for you when you come to collect that, yes. I could supply to government. Yes. You are you're seeing I've made a sale. You know? Yes. It is tracked under IFRIS. Yes. But actually, I'm not receiving that money in time. And then I'm paying this. So how do you factor in this? Because yes. people are saying, but a business is equal. Mm. You are as refused to understand the dynamics traders go through. Mm. And for you, you're just saying, for us, our mandate is to collect tax. It is on record that in Uganda today, many businesses that open do not live to see their first birthday. I was uh, following a meeting where the Commissioner General and many, and one of the traders said, the traders you're speaking to, they're from Chikubo. As some are entering and they're bound to fail, others are coming in. So when you have so many traders, you think business is going. Do you go to understand these dynamics? You're uh, so rich. Yes, no, but I, I need to say first, nobody mm. benefits, benefits, nobody, government or the business mm. operator and all the other players around it. Nobody benefits from a business that has failed. Mm. It doesn't benefit anyone. And it's in the interest of everyone to see that businesses thrive because when they thrive, they give people more jobs, they, mm. they, 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 they forward backward linkages, they, they, they purchase more from the farmers, Okay, and then they export more, we get the other, the dollar, we, the farmer gets where to sell their output from the farm and so many other things. So nobody benefits, they give jobs and many other things. So the rigidity that you're talking about for the Uganda Revenue Authority is a question of whether the Uganda Revenue Authority should follow what has been handed down to it by Parliament as the law or to find convenient moments to relax the law from the way it is. I don't know whether you get me. Mm -hmm. In the current state of things, we have been given a Value Added Tax Act, which assumes by default that a transaction has happened mm -hmm. and therefore tax has to to be reported on it mm -hmm. within the next 15 days after it has hap mm -hmm. the, the month has ended on the earlier of the following. When the goods are delivered, oh. when a payment is made, or when an invoice is issued. I don't know whether you get it. That is what so, the law says. Yes. So you look at... Now the, we go to practicability. Yes, yes exactly. Because so the scenario is mm. when the goods have been delivered and mm. then the person is putting them to use, when the payment has been made or when the invoice has been issued. Now, that is how we are mm. being uh, requested by or guided by the law to consider a transaction to have happened. Mm. So even a credit sale <coughs> in the default set, the, the default set of the mm. law, a credit sale is actually considered to be a sale and tax is expected. Now, where we would need to consider mm. a, an, a, a transaction as tax due on to it is under ca a cash arrangement. And the cash basis accounting arrangement is still available under the law. But it is only for persons whose mm -hmm. turnover is 500 million in a yeah. year and below. Mm -hmm. 
you can apply for it. Mm. And so in that case, you will be considered or required to declare any expenditure or any mm -hmm. transaction or any, mm. uh, any sale or purchase or expense. You report it for value added taxes, mm -hmm. I mean value added tax, when the payment actually happens, when the mm. cash is actually expensed or the cash is actually received. You can apply for that. It is mm. available. And uh, I mean, some people have applied for it. Some people have received it. But the so do you say there is a knowledge gap? The reason because knowledge most gap, of the businesses, yes. you know this. Yes, a person will take goods mm. for you. The system captures, but they don't pay within fifteen days. And these yes. are businesses are running. Yes, downtown. you can apply for the cash accounting mm. uh, facility. It is mm. in there. It is your right. It is not mm. the mercy of URA. It mm. is your right within the law. But then, within the past year, we've seen also an amendment that came through, uh, still f through Parliament that persons who have made supplies to government, mm. okay, mm. Uh, to government entities and government agencies, MDAs, will be allowed to report their transactions only when the payment has been made. Oh. Because we've also made scenarios mm. where URA is giving you a tax bill, mm -hmm. but you supply to government and government has not yet paid you. So the consideration for persons who have supplied to government agencies and entities has been made within the law. Now, the other extension of it has been already there in the law for mm. people who would like to use the cash accounting facility. But where your turnover is above mm. 500 million in a year, that has not, I mean, that does, it doesn't cater for that. If we need it to happen, mm. or if, even if we need for the cash accounting to be the default, mm then we may need to ask that there is an amendment in the law and that is under the legislative arm of government not uh, where the ura sits at the present well uh, that is something that the traders must also factor now let's go to something that is very annoying mm. what is that and i must say mm. i was very impressed when the commissioner general accepted what i'm going to say mm. there are rotten beans in URA, mm. that when a trader is offloading, remember viewers, we said that you must have a turnover of 150 million and above. Mm. Now, recently we saw uh, agents of URA as traders are unload, offloading, you know, they are demanding where is IFRIS, you know, they're supposed to be on VAT, mm. and this enforcement has promoted corruption. Mm -hmm. Now, a trader, because they feel they don't, you know, there's a belief that when you are a speaker, it has spoken. When an officer, viewer has spoken, you're going to tell us that, yes, you can't appeal, mm -hmm. but traders are being conned, are being robbed, are being cheated. By being told you're in a threshold of a turn up of 150, a million, so you're supposed to be on if list. Mm -hmm. I need the documents. If not, we are confiscating. Chiku go there. Mm -hmm. and, there and then someone, temuntuara, temuntuara. You see, you see, you know, you know. Money is going. Yes. You've put, there are agents you find almost at doorsteps. You know? Mm -hmm. Because you and I and many could be land. But reality is we know our business people. A number of them under Kassid. By the mercy of God, they have made it. Yes. But when you talk about bring computer, go lodge in, complain, the tax extensions you're saying, this poor person is worried of their business. I know you've received these claims as well. Yes. We've had uh, scenarios that mm. are regrettable uh, that have been reported by traders uh, where uh, some say... Uh, they have been asked for money for them to be released mm. and circumstances of the kind. And s these have been investigated internally by, by our staff compliance team. The proceedings mm. are still uh, going. going on. Uh, anyone find culpable, of course, mm. will be brought to the book, uh, like we've seen in previous circumstances where any office of the URA has been found to have in contravention of our code of conduct and what the law actually requires uh, of us in our execution, professional execution of our mandate. 
as long as I'm again, I mean, I'm off the law, the lane that has been defined by the law, I'll have to be brought to the book. So those are regrettable, but uh, the current kind of uh, compliance uh, activity and monitoring that we are having in the central business district and across the country, mm -hmm. I need to say the entire country across, we have IFRIS compliance monitoring teams. Mm -hmm. It's only that within the central business district, there is that kind of coverage that is giving it an uh, uh, optimal view for everyone. But we have IFRIS, D Digital Tracking Solution Enforcement and Monitoring mm. Teams across the country, and this is happening everywhere. Uh, we started with awareness for all. IFRIS was implemented in 2020, just at the start of COVID. Mm. And four years down the road, we've not had as strict the, uh, I mean, as much strict uh, enforcement and monitoring as we have now, because the thinking within the Uganda Revenue Authority is the post-COVID uh, mm. breather that everyone could have needed to get inducted into the usage of IFRIS has been a, a kind of enough to give people the window to get on board. If there is need for more time, we are still available. I will tell you, for all the three years, for the, all the four years of implementing IFRIS, we've conducted over 200 engagements, meeting with the trader groups, mm -hmm. specifically value-added tax groups, taxpayers, to engage them and teach them on the usage of IFRIS in ERA offices and in their locations, in the areas where they conduct At that business. point, yes. uh, Michael, when you talk about education, yes. maybe the viewer needs to know yes. that when we talk about IFRIS, uh, and those on VAT, it takes understanding of how to go through these things. Because this is what it involves. A wholesaler or a person on this platform, one, must have, would I call it, knowledge of how to use either a smartphone yes. or a computer. Because every transaction he does, it must be captured. Some have called them cell point machines mm. that one must have. Mm. Then you must remember that there you, are options. There are options, mm. but some good like of cell point machines. Mm. Then you must capture everything that you've sold. Then it must be looped. I want to use to the URA portal. Yes. So that URA must follow. Now, this may not be easy for everybody, mm. as you've said that you've given information. Yes. Most of given the nature of our people in business, this is not to sound insultive or anything, but this is the realistic perspective of it. Mm. Now, one, even the gadgets needed may be the technical ability for someone to easily understand how to move around, give you the right information, is still a problem. To what extent have you gone? So, uh, like I was saying, uh, the awareness activities that we've conducted, the training that we've conducted in local languages, mm -hmm. printing this information in the languages that people understand, uh, creating short guides on how to go around the IFRIS, uh, also coming to media stations mm. like the UBC, we've been on UBC Star, all the channels that are mm -hmm. available, I'll tell you, mm -hmm. I have been hosted and we've had the opportunity to train and engage with people, specifically for the CBD, I'll tell you. While we have done engagements in the mm. previous years, this year particularly, we have been in the CBD since August. And the compliance enhancement activities have only started around uh, January, <coughs> February. Mm. But since August, you found us in over 110 buildings, from arcade to arcade, from Majestic to Navukera, Mutasa, Kaferu. Talk about every arcade. We've had teams moving shop to shop, talking to over 15,000 traders, mm. engaging them on IFRIS, those who are actually VAT registered, talking to them about how they need to use this. We've conducted workshops in these overnight 90 workshops with these, uh, with these oh. traders. We've, even after we've set up a workshop, because we've been to these arcades working with the business community leaders oh. and associations, and 
everywhere we finished doing or conducting a workshop, we left a hub. So we leave a team that mm -hmm. positions itself uh, under a tent or in a veranda or in a space provided to us mm -hmm. by the building owners. And that team was there to just handhold and assist. So the scenario of lack of awareness may not be sorted within a day, but the work is ongoing. What we think is, so far the engagement and the awareness that we have created uh, should be enough to start someone on, mm. on the usage of IFRIS. Part of the challenges that have been addressed and uh, voiced by the business community have been on how complicated the system was. Mm. So we started and it was system to system, so you had to get your point of sale, uh, mm. uh, maybe, I mean, your ERP systems for these big supermarkets and mm -hmm. big wholesalers and retailers to connect and integrate with the URA. It was, of course, a bit uh, uh, complicated and complex. Mm. So we moved on to the web-based version. Mm -hmm. Web-based version where you just need a, a computer gadget and you connect to the URA system, of course, with internet. Mm -hmm. And then that was also a bit tricky. We advanced and brought the desktop application that can allow you issue an invoice and uh, within 24 hours, you can reconnect to the internet and issue and may, mm -hmm. may, maybe send it to, to, to the person. Mm -hmm. But still, that desk, which is offline, that even without internet <coughs> for 24 hours, you can issue these invoices. Mm -hmm. Still, with the complications of that, uh, and again, listening to our taxpayers, having also tried to issue them with electronic fiscal devices. And the uptake was not... That good. That good. Uh, mm. People were hesitant to take on these tools. Mm. We went back and we thought about the kind of client that we have. Mm. And we thought this value added taxpayer who has a turnover sales in a year of 150 million mm. may at least have a smartphone. Mm. So we developed an IFRIS uh, application that fits on a smartphone. And so we brought out this application and we've rolled it out. And we think our traders, the business community, can use it to issue electronic invoices and receipts mm. with the taxpayers. So the simplicity and the support that we've been giving to our taxpayers has been on the technology side mm. and on the information and awareness side. Now that is one. Two, I have been in over six engagements since... February, the Commissioner General of the Uganda Revenue Authority, the senior management of the Uganda Revenue Authority, engaging with business leaders and traders on the challenges that we are meeting and how we can design and devise workarounds to those challenges. So there is an issuing discussion on how to address these gaps. Oh. And the, the point is, how do we find the solutions as quickly as possible? And that is so far where we are. Yeah. But for us, having enforced the electronic fiscal receipting and invoicing solution, and a good number of the business community is yeah. using it, and others are not using it, that in itself creates market distortions. Yeah. The same URA, collecting taxes from the same business community, yeah. is Some pre only presiding, the yes, system. presiding over yeah. a regime where others are using IFRIS and others are not using it. That's it's not fair. Statistics you've made a loss yes. of about forty billion. The, the, in the, the first performance year. of indirect tax, mm. indirect taxes generally mm. is at eight six percent mm. of the target. But since initiating IFRIS, and yes, forcing. Yes, but there have been uh, improvements in mm. the value added tax performance, but uh, the targets mm. that we envision to have have not yet been met, and it is the IFRIS system that we think, or a solution like oh. IFRIS in its working, that can lead us to the efficiency of value-added tax as we may need it. The performance of our peers, mm. Tanzania, Rwanda, Kenya, it's in revenue, high. administration and collections, is not by mistake or by chance that they are performing as good as oh. they are. If you take a stroll around those countries, you realize that they are implementing similar solutions like this, and it is what is giving them the efficiency to mobilize the revenue as, as they have it. As long as we are still at 52% of funding our budget, 
we are not in a good place and we may need to, to look inside ourselves mm. and uh, find workable mechanisms of mobilizing revenue within ourselves to see that we have a better, a better financing of the, internal, the domestic projects that we are embarking on as a country. And so I look forward to that time when what we are doing connects and meets traders at their frequency mm. and we have a working relationship that actually gives us uh, the efficiencies in how the businesses operate and how the revenue administration actually operates. Well, uh, <coughs> time seems up, but I just want to thank uh, Michael Masembe for your time mm -hmm. and explaining this. Even in biblical times, uh, tax was not something that people wanted to pay. If you remember the tax collector, I think that was Zacchaeus, mm -hmm. uh, where people felt he shouldn't even come at the table to feast. But also, when you remember when Jesus was asked uh, and he picked a coin and it had the one side, the head of Caesar, the emperor then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But the bottom line of this question was they expected Jesus to tell them, do not pay tax. However, more education, I believe, is needed, we more sensitization. But also looking at how best do we keep this business community floating, alive, amidst these taxes, taxes. And above all, proper use of the tax that people are paying. Have a lovely day. Ruben is ready to take you through sports updates. Good morning.